Overboard is a surprise new game released by Inkle, the developers behind the likes of Heaven's Vault and 80 Days. And whilst fans of Passapartout's adventures may notice the similar art style and use of multiple dialogue options from that game, what's different about this one is who you get to play. You are Veronica Villainzy, a West End starlet who, for various reasons, has had enough of her husband, so on a sea voyage to New York does what the title suggests and pushes him overboard. Now as the player, you have to try and get away with murder before you arrive, speaking with the ship's passengers and crew to work out who knows what and whether they need to be dealt with. Push her over! Whee! I lunch before she's expecting it! Yes! I caught up with Inkle's co-founder and narrative director John Ingold to find out more about the surprise launch of the game and how they made it in just over three and a half months. So I will start by saying... Very excited uh, to be speaking to uh, John Ingold. He's obviously the co-founder, narrative director of Inkle, um, which are known obviously for lots of excellent games like 80 Days, Sorcery, Pendragon, Heaven's Vault, and now a new one uh, called Overboard, a new surprise one, I think, for many people. Um, thank you very much, John, first of all, for talking. That's cool. Um, and... Funny. Just tell us a little bit about how did this game come about? What what were your inspirations? So those are kind of two quite separate questions yeah. in a way. Because how the game came about, normally we have an idea that we want to make. Like we're like, oh, let's make a space archaeology game or let's make whatever. Um, and then we set off and work out how to make that. But that's not how Overboard came about. Overboard came about because winter this year was really, really rubbish. It was, as, as I think we all know, right? Winter was a horrible winter. And then just as we thought it was going to be okay, there was another lockdown again. And we were all feeling miserable. And we're in the middle of a, a fairly long game project that we're working on at the moment, set in the Scottish Highlands. But that's going, that's, that's taking its time and that's fine. So we thought, let's just do something fun to cheer ourselves up. Let's just finish something. Let's just make something. And then we sat about and thought, well, what can we make? What can we make quickly and make sure that we definitely can finish? And that was kind of a nice idea. And then we put that, we sort of thought about that. And then the idea for Overboard just sort of appeared and everyone loved it. And so we made it. Um, it's nice when that and, happens. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's kind of like, but I can't I can't work out whether the idea was just there waiting to be made or whether it's because we never actually stopped and said to ourselves, what's something that we could make really quickly without having to figure out anything new? Like what's what's an idea that we know is going to work? We just know it's going to work um, rather than having to normally you, you make something and you try it and you iterate on it. And I mean, we did iterate in the end on Overboard, but the core concept was just it was its own thing. I, I don't know. I mean, we did it so recently. It yeah. still feels like we're still reacting to this thing. We only started it in January. Um, but the actual concept, uh, it's a murder mystery. Only it's a whodunit, except you're the one who done it, which is not a spoiler because no. it says so on the box. Um, I think at the time I just listened to Murder on the Orient Express on the radio and we've been playing Cluedo. Uh, me and my kids, we got a Cluedo set. For Christmas and I think those two things came together and I thought we really haven't made a murder mystery game like we've been Inkle's been around for 10 years and we haven't made a classic murder mystery like this is a thing we should have done already so let's do it now maybe I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> no I think that makes sense because I think when I played it, it I I was basically like this is a kind of reverse cluedo where you know who's done it but you have to convince everybody else that it wasn't you yeah exactly and like oh yeah we got a cluedo set for christmas and the first game we played my my son who's five was playing and you know he's five he really he really doesn't like losing at games he finds that very hard and he was playing this cluedo game he was on a team with with my wife and they got to the end and they revealed the murderer and the murderer was was him it was his character in the game and he burst into tears because mm -hmm. We, we couldn't work out why. And then we realized it's because he thought he'd lost because he'd been outed as the murderer because he hadn't quite understand. Oh. But Cluedo has this weird thing where you can end up accusing yourself and win the game. Um, I think that, I think that we, we had that game the day before 
I had the idea for overboards. I think it was kind of in my head of like, what if that wasn't a bug? What, what if that wasn't a problem with the game of Cluedo that it could end up being you, but you didn't know you did it? What if, what if that was the whole point? Um, it is an idea I've, I've used before about 10, 15 years ago, I wrote an indie game with a similar twist. So I've kind of always meant to do something along these lines, but yeah, overboard was such a clear idea. It really popped into, it just came in one go. Um, and then tell me about the idea to keep it as a surprise as well, because obviously for me, I was given this game to review, but then I was surprised that obviously there was there was literally nothing out there about it. Um, and and uh, that was so hard. Yes. Yeah, first <laughs> of all, so tell me why you decided to do that, and then tell me what was it like doing that. So. Originally, we thought, let's just make something really quickly and finish it. And we thought, well, OK, if we do that, it's not going to be it's not going to be great. Right. It's going to be fine. We'll make a throwaway thing. Maybe we'll give it away free or we'll give it away as a like along with ink as a kind of sample project. Just just we, we kind of thought, OK, this isn't going to be a big commercial product for us. So then we thought, well, OK, if it's not going to be a great game, we don't want to get in the way of advertising and talking about the Highland game that we're really working on. So let's let's not muddle things up. Let's just make it a nice surprise. So that idea just was there really early on. Let's make this a nice surprise. And then we started developing the game and we spent maybe a month. Um, I spent maybe a month just on my own, just writing the script. And I loved it. I didn't yeah. just like it or wasn't enjoying it. I bloody loved it. <laughs> and like I would wake up every morning and go, yeah, what are we doing today? And I had a list of I had this list of all the sorts of things that ought to happen in a Poirot inspired game. And they started off as really easy, obvious things like, you know, there should be some evidence you can dispose of and there should, you know, whatever. There should be a lie, a contradiction that you get trapped on. And it got through to really crazy stuff. You know, somebody should be able to throw a body out of a waste disposal chute or something like that. Yeah. And pretty much everything on this list, I would just go, right, well, I can't, there's no way I can get this in here. That's too ridiculous. And then I'd wake up the next morning and think, oh no, I can. If I do it here and that that loop of constantly layering in more and more of these farcical situations was so fun that by the end of this month, I presented it to the team and I was firstly like, look, have a play of this and see what you think. Um, and they kind of, I think, caught that energy as well. And we all just we all just kind of sat there and went, this is this is actually quite is this good? This might be good. Maybe we could make this good. Um, but by that point, the whole idea of let's do it fast and fun and let's make it a nice surprise. They were kind of part of the DNA of the project. So it mm. felt like, you know, let's let's do this as a surprise reveal. Let's give everybody a nice moment of joy. Let's see if we can have a launch that isn't like a bunch of people have wish listed it for three weeks. And then this thing comes out and people go, oh, yeah, I vaguely remember reading about that two weeks ago. And I was sort of interested in it. Let's have a launch which is just totally, hopefully enthusiasm it's just like one moment of just something really great happening and we thought that would be really nice actually and we all need that we all need a moment of joy in this miserable year and maybe sure. maybe this could be it because it's a fun idea and we think it's a fun game so maybe that can be that um but, i mean we were constantly questioning it constantly like throughout we were going well look are we just mad to release a game on steam <laughs> with no with like with zero wish list because you give it to the Steam algorithm machine and it goes, you have zero wish list. Your game is crap, and it yeah. puts it in a bin. That's what Steam does, and um, I think it's fair to say that you know we were terrified of that. And like an hour before we released, I was talking to Joe. And he was like, are you, are you nervous? And I was like, this is a disaster. What are we doing? We say something <laughs> good and we're just literally binning it. Why, why are we, what? Um, and I couldn't believe it. But, but actually, uh, I think it's gone really well. It's gone really well. And like, you know, it wasn't a completely surprise reveal because, you know, obviously we sent a code out to you so you could cover it at Adventure yeah. Gamers. And um we we had a news piece in IGN and a news piece in Eurogamer, like, and they'd seen it before launch as well. And they're not like full reviews; they're just they're just little moments of notice, right? Sure. And and like Nintendo put the trailer on their YouTube channel, yeah. which is actually massive. Like, yeah. I can't mess about. Like, when I remember when they told us <laughs> they were doing that, and we were like, "Oh, thank God, somebody cares." You know? <laughs> um, 
so like it's not like we really just went from from zero to doing okay because i yeah. think we're doing okay um but yeah they, it just felt like it was part of the energy of the project if that doesn't sound too like arty farty and rubbish like because the one thing we really couldn't decide or i couldn't decide everyone else on the team said it was obvious and we did do it that way but i was really sure that we ought to not tell people the hook of the game so okay. we could just release it and say, Inkle's made a detective game. And you start playing it and you're like, okay, Inkle's made a detective game. Wait, what are you doing? Wait, what's this now? Oh my God, what have I just done? Because I thought that moment would be amazing if you bought this game and then suddenly you drop right in it. And I was totally wrong. It's obviously a great hook and it obviously should be in the trailer. Uh, yes, the I was going to say, <laughs> but I'm glad you didn't do that and you gave yeah, the but... hook because people need to yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, I argued long and passionately and loudly to not do that. And everybody else, you know, very politely told me I was being an idiot and they were absolutely <laughs> right. I'm really, really <laughs> glad I didn't win that argument because it would have been really stupid. Um you know maybe some people get that moment of joy that moment of surprise just watching the trailer right if they don't know anything about so. it and they see yeah. the trailer and they think yeah exactly so that'll do that'll do <laughs> i mean were there, were there any close shaves then in, in this getting outed before i mean all i'll say is looking back on your twitter you were definitely having <laughs> fun weren't you you were giving you were every so often you were giving little hints to this using the word overboard in your tweets you you're having a bit yeah, of fun there no, weren't you I mean, was it fun? I don't know. I think I was going a bit mad, actually, because I was really enjoying writing it. And I'm like, normally I try to talk about what I'm doing and the way that we're using ink and the ideas that you have about kind of structure and stuff. You're like, because there's a little community of writers and narrative designers and stuff. And, you know, these, these are people I talk to on Twitter quite a lot. And it's weird not talking about what you're doing when you're excited about it. And... So I think what I was, well, the problem I was having was I would go to Twitter and be like, look, I really want to talk about this, but I know I can't talk about Overboard, but I can't quite not talk about Overboard, so I'm going to accidentally put the word Overboard in there. <laughs> and then our PR, um, the lady who does PR at the studio, she's a freelancer called Emily Morganti, yep. would write me a message saying, no, you really have to not do that. If this is going <laughs> to be a surprise, it needs to be a surprise, which means you need to stop doing this. <laughs> And I'd be like, yeah, you know, okay, that's my last one. That's my last one. And then a couple of weeks later, I'd be like, oh, I've got an idea. I've got an idea. Um, but even that was quite pleasing, actually, because like it's a detective game with clues, right? Yeah. And now I can look back and go, ah, oh, you see, the clues were all there. Yeah. Um, and that's really fun. I like the fact that IGN reported it as is a game that was announced on April Fool's Day as a joke that's actually a real game. Yeah. Like, well, that's because yeah, that's what you cool. did. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was quite fun. That was quite fun. Uh, uh, what was it like uh, making it making it in secret then, and, and designing it in secret? Was it was that any different to to how you would normally, or was that basically the same apart from obviously the promotion angle? Was, was it different actually making it in secret as well? You know, it's funny. Normally, when we've done other games, we have talked about them as we develop them, but we're really cautious about what we show because sure. there's that thing of well, if you you know if you show a piece of art and it's not good enough, then that's it. You've lost everybody straight away, or, or whatever. Um, and we tried to show Heaven's Vault a lot as we were developing it, but it, it I don't know how useful that was to us in terms of visibility. And it wasn't great for us as a team either, because you show things and people say, oh, yeah, that's OK. Nobody ever goes, wow, that looks amazing. Or very few people do because they don't really get it because they haven't really had a chance to sit down and really try it and understand yeah. it. And of course, you get people being negative, right? Whenever you show anything on the internet, you're going to get people being negative, And that really sticks with you. And if that happens after launch, I can shrug it off and say, well, it's too late now. If that happens one year into a four-year project, it, it, it's there in the back of your head the whole time, this, this bit of negativity you didn't need. So actually, we tend to be really careful about what we show mm. anyway. So in a way, it wasn't that different, apart from the fact that I wanted to talk about things that i want to talk about and i got kind of annoyed about not doing that and actually uh, for all of our games it's the one where we did the most actual play testing ironically and like i think partly because of we, we keep learning from project to project what what sort of things we need to test in advance but but also we had this sense that because it was a surprise launch it had to really work on day one like it had to be you had to be able to pick it up and just play it straight away it had to make total sense without any context so like one of the things we play tested was 
do people really understand that Veronica actually kills Malcolm in that opening cutscene, or do they think it's a dream or a flashback? Like, do they really? At the first early builds, the writing was a little bit confusing, or the animation wasn't quite clear enough, and people were kind of going, "Well, I was trying to work out whether or not I actually really did it because that's such a weird idea." Even when we're told them up front that that was the idea of the game, so we kind of we used friends, and we used. Um, uh, a few professional contacts, but we kind of would record people playing it over Discord and then what, talk to them and, and everyone would sit down and watch these videos and figure out what they did and what they got right and what they didn't. And that was way more analytical than we've ever done on a project. And it was so good. It was so good. Like so much of the script got fixed from watching that. So many little usability features got fixed. The whole, the whole replay system to let you kind of replay quickly through previous choices, which I think is really key actually mm -hmm. to how you play the game. Um, that just didn't exist until like a sort of a month before release when we started to notice people were just getting, they'd hit the beginning of a scene which they'd played through a hundred times before and they'd just get that real kind of, oh, I really don't want to. And we were like, right, this needs to be, this needs to be stupidly fast to do, to just re-execute something that you've done before. So we came up with an idea and we tested a few versions and we ended up with this, this the system that we have. Um, so actually, even though the game was made in secret, it was the most like it was the most using other people's brains project that we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, mainly just because uh, like, there's four of us on the team and uh, Tom Kale, who's our developer, kept having bits of downtime where the script would be behind or the art would be behind. He didn't have anything to do. So he went off and did play testing because he felt like he thought it was interesting and he felt like doing it. Um, but it was totally worth it. And definitely something I think we're going to do on the rest of our projects now because we've really, like, it It was, it yeah. It, it really feels like we've released version 10 of this game, not version one of it. And I, like, yeah, which is impressive like considering it was, what, the, about 100 days to make it? Yeah, it was 100 days. Um, four people, and I'm the only person on the team who worked all of those 100. Wow. Uh, so Tom worked maybe 80 of them. Annie, our artist, did about half, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it was I, I, it was funny, really, actually. I, I think it's the first project we've ever made properly. Like, we actually did the production plan and we kind of stuck to it and we did things in a sensible order because we had this sense that we were supposed to do it quickly because it wasn't a real game. So we couldn't <laughs> couldn't just mess about or in, be too self-indulgent. And as a result, we did it quite well and everyone was quite happy. <laughs> like, I don't know, it went really, really well for some reason. Um, um, we uh, Sort of on that point, we've got a question in the chat saying, how did the characters in the, in the game evolve from the original concept to the finalised version? All right, that, that is a really good question, actually. Um, so the first thing that happened was I wrote the very first scene. I just wrote it in a notebook. It just came into my head. This, this lady wakes up and she's lost one of her earrings and she's pushed her husband overboard. And that character pretty much walked into my head, sat down and just told me who she was and what she was doing. And like, I remember somebody asking me, like, why, why does she push her husband overboard? And, and as the player, aren't, isn't that a bit, isn't that an awful thing to do? Isn't that a really terrible thing to do? And I had this moment of, oh, yeah, it is a terrible thing to do. I hadn't really realised it was. A, and I thought, why have I not realised I'm making a game about someone doing something really horrible? And then I realised it was because this character had just walked in and told me that it was fine. And I just completely believed her. Like, she, she's just there. <laughs> it sort of sounds psychotic, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it is. Maybe that's just writing. But um, so she was totally formed from the beginning. She knew exactly who she wanted to be. She, she's great. By and then, way. She's a great character. Oh, I love her so much. I just, <laughs> oh, she's like, brilliant. She's just so, she's like, just so nice to write a character who will just do anything and knows exactly what they want. Yeah. And yeah, it's just glorious. I love it. No, she's so much fun. Um, I'm glad she connects with other people and people don't just think she's like horrible. <laughs> <as well. laughs> um, and then I suppose the other characters kind of came out of just who would be good to play off against her. So, you know, you needed... You needed a character like Clarissa, so that's the, the woman that Malcolm's having an affair with, who's kind of, kind of, uh, she's sort of a mirror of what Veronica would be if Veronica didn't have the inner strength 
that she has. Like Veronica is really shallow and she really cares what people think about her. And Clarissa really cares about what she thinks about her, except Veronica refuses to let that get in her way. Whereas Clarissa can't handle that feeling and it kind of dominates everything that she does. And that like reflection between the two of them, like they ought to be, they ought to be best. They ought to be like a big sister and a little sister. They ought to be helping each other out and, and, but they're but they're not. <laughs> they're instead they're in this utterly contemptuous relationship, and that that kind of that yeah she came out of that quite directly, Clarissa. And then Carstairs is, you know, Veronica is is she's she's striking, right? She's drop dead gorgeous. She's powerful. She can probably twist any young man around her finger very very easily, so easily that she probably doesn't even realise she's doing it half the time. So Carstairs is a guy who it just doesn't work on, and that is incredibly irritating to Veronica because mm. like she ought to be able to just tell him what to do like he finds her her lost earring she be, ought to be able to just say give me that back and tell nobody about it and he'll just do it because that's what she's used to but Carl says it just brushes straight over him um because he's got this kind of English indifference that she just can't penetrate and that I love I love that dynamic between them um and then I guess uh so it, a, a lot of these characters would just sort of emerge from, I'd write a good argument between Veronica and somebody, and then the character would emerge from that. Uh, I think Lady Lady Armstrong came out of that, the first time you meet her at breakfast, and I think the first thing she says to, is you, she says to you is, Veronica, you look awful. Yes. And, like, and you <laughs> like, could say, so point. do you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and she's, and uh, I, loved, I loved writing Lady Armstrong, because she's just such, she's a great, She's just such a fun character to write because she just doesn't care if she offends people. So she's she's so snippy and so rude. Um, yeah, and so the actually all those characters all just emerge really pretty much directly out of the writing process, which is good because I didn't have much time to redraft anything. Um, I spent a bit more time on uh, Major Singh. He started off as a kind of English army general which is a, a really stock Agatha Christie character the kind of yeah. army general with the bristling mustache he's in everything and he's always really honorable and he's always really moral and I was about halfway through playing it when, and I and I thought actually I don't need this guy he's not doing anything and I wondered about making him and Lady Armstrong the same character making her be the detective and just reducing the scope of it and I'm glad I didn't I almost did um and then I was reading something I can't remember what it was oh I remember what it was actually it was so yeah, winter in Britain was this year was rubbish, right? And one of the things that was rubbish about it was Brexit happened, um, and that was rubbish. And the government didn't do anything to help it. And just around Christmas, I think it was the week after Christmas, there were lorry drivers queued up against the French border, yes. sleeping in their trucks for days on end with no way out in the snow, in the cold. Um, the borders were all closed or not functioning because of the pandemic, because the government had closed the borders in the middle of a of a global health crisis. And just nobody cared about these truck drivers at all. And um, but one group did. One, there was a group of, uh, I can't remember their name, I can't remember the name exactly, but it's a Sikh aid agency. It's a Sikh charity. Sent guys on motorbikes with hot food to, and they took it to these truck drivers. These were the same guys, I think, who were taking hot curries to NHS workers in the London hospitals earlier in the pandemic. Um, and they just went out and did this. And I and I just was kind of stunned by like the way that, you know, they're in the middle of Kent, these guys, but there were no Christian church groups out there giving hot dinners to the truck drivers. There were there were no there was no one apart from these seats on motorbikes who were like just being awesome. And that made me think uh, I think that set me off reading a bit about Sikhism. And that got me reading about the role of Sikhs in the British Army in the 30s and, and the First Great War which is really complicated because Britain kind of owns India, but India doesn't really like Britain. But here are these guys fighting with... And I just fell into a rabbit hole of exploring like a little bit of the, the 30s relationship with Sikhs. And I was just like, I really like Sikhism. It's awesome. It's such a cool religion. I love everything I've read about it. And so I thought, well, I should write this. This is the guy. And so, so Major Singh just kind of became that. And the more that I wrote, the happier I was with it. And as a thing to do and I, I don't know how good a depiction of a of a 1930s Sikh army officer he is because there's not a lot of source material mm. about that I found some but there wasn't as much as I would have liked 
So I feel a little bit like I, I keep expecting someone to email me and say, you've got this so wrong. And that would be that would be valid. That would be fine. But like, yeah, he was a pleasure. He was a pleasure to write once I found out who he was. And he was definitely a whole in the first draft. He was just he was totally a placeholder. He was pretty much called general placeholder. <laughs> like, you know, like, it took me a while to find to find what made him tick. And so he he changed a lot. Um, and the commander didn't know the command. The, yeah, the commander was. <laughs> he's almost he's almost quite straightforward actually as a character i think mostly because veronica doesn't really care about him particularly no <laughs> like, yeah he's yeah. just a man he's, he's just a man in a nice hat yeah <laughs> um we kind of find out as as we play as we do a couple of playthroughs of the game as well that her husband was sort of in with fascists very much. Mm. Was that always um, part of the plan as well, or was that was that put in there to make us, you know, warm to our protagonist more and maybe <laughs> dislike her husband more? I, I was wondering whether that that was kind of a, a decision put in there for that, or or just the choices around that. Yeah, I think I think ultimately it is it's part of a kind of wider project so the, the game starts with her murdering malcolm and i suppose when you first come into it you might have a question about whether this is valid or not and then that puts the player in a position of wanting to find ways to justify it right because they they want to know that malcolm wasn't like you know a gentle kind loving partner who who was really helpful yes. and like maybe did a bit of charity work on the side yeah. you know as a player <laughs> you, you don't you don't want to find that out you want it to turn out that veronica was right and that malcolm was awful and so i found i think i found this partly just by writing it that every time you dropped a little hint that maybe malcolm was kind of perhaps a bit violent actually like there's a couple of places where she suggests he was a bit of a brute um but that would make you go, oh, oh, good, good. No, he was violent, yeah. so he deserved it. Okay, that's good. Um, and then, oh, he was probably having an affair with this other woman on the boat. Well, that that's pretty bad. And, and not only that, the woman he's having an affair with, she's really young, actually, and like she's pretty insecure. So he's probably like, he's probably done something pretty bad there. So that's that's good. You know, that that's that's better. And once I was into that mindset, I was like, right, how can we up the ante? How can we up the ante? Yeah. You know, uh -huh. what would be even Fascism. better than that? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, no, he's a Nazi. That's yeah. brilliant. <laughs> like, yeah. And you shouldn't find that out until your third or fourth playthrough when you're like, whee! Yeah, Nazi. that's what yeah. I did. I was like, get him in the sea. Get him in the sea <laughs> exactly. now. So then every time he screams, you can have this little pleasure of like, oh, good. Um, <laughs> and I thought that was nice because I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you do, um, was it three years ago, all that internet drama about whether it was okay to punch a Nazi yes. or not? Um, and like, I just feel like that's such a naive, and innocent point of view as we enter 2021 and kind of post-Trumpism and all the rest of it. But like, let, let's be really clear. We are, you, uh, I mean, I'm sure we're much the same age and we were both brought up with the same key idea that it's not just okay to punch a Nazi. You are supposed to kill Nazis without checking what their names are. That's what you do with Nazis. It's what Indiana Jones does. It's what James Bond does. It's what every single hero of every single action movie that you and I must have grown up watching. Yeah. What Star Wars is about. These people don't even get to have faces in Star Wars. That's the choice you make when you become a Nazi. And I don't like the way we've muddied that um, because whether or not we should actually kill actual Nazis for being Nazi in the real world, we certainly shouldn't pay them the slightest bit of respect until they come back to being actual real human beings um, because that's what Nazism is. It's a decision to abdicate your humanity. So at that point, you don't have any humanity and you don't deserve any humanity until you come and get it back again. And I feel like that is not, that is not a bad point of view to have. So I definitely would... Yeah, I, I definitely felt like it was a perfectly viable and valid thing uh, to do. And whether it fully justifies what Veronica does, I'm not sure. That's okay because it's a story, so yes, it doesn't matter. Exactly. <laughs> but it do, I think it does help for sure, definitely. Um, into, we have another question from the chat saying, did the idea that it didn't feel like a real game take some of the stress away from it a little bit because I know I remember you speaking about Heaven's Vault, which was obviously a much bigger project and how a lot you know you all felt quite burnt out from it it was a, obviously a big mm. game to take on mm. but with mm. this did, did, did it not feeling like a real game did that help quite a lot it did it totally did but i think it also it goes both ways right like it's partly 
I could write things and just say, well, I'm enjoying this, so I'm going to write this thing. Or if I didn't like something, I didn't worry about whether it needed to be there. I just sort of think, well, I, I'm not enjoying this. I'm just going to cut it. Um, but also, it, it really influenced the design of the game as well. That, and I think not just for me as the writer, but for, for everybody else, that we just ended up not doing anything we didn't feel like doing. So like for a long time, we were talking about whether we wanted a timeline screen, where, which would show you all the things you'd discovered and the times they happened so you could keep track of, of a day's playthrough. And uh, UI design, graphic design, goes to Joe, Joseph Humphrey, co-founder of Inkle. And he said, no, I did a timeline for Heaven's Vault and it took ages and it really burned me out and I never want to have to do that again. I refuse <laughs> to do anything which sounds like a timeline. And I was like, but it wouldn't really be like the, the Heaven's Vault timeline. It would just be a list. He's like, no, I'm sorry. I'm not doing timelines anymore. So we didn't do it. And like, I don't know whether the game is better or worse for not having it, but, but there's kind of this spirit, this slightly punk spirit of, well, we don't feel like doing it. So we're not doing it, um, which is quite liberating actually. And, Perhaps less so for Annie, who had to draw the pictures, because I did give her a list of all the pictures that we needed. You know, she drew them in the order that she felt like drawing them. And I think she probably paid attention to the ones she liked and, and busked out the other ones or, or whatever. But um, but I, I think that was really that was really empowering, actually, that feeling that if you wanted to do something, then you could do it. So uh, Tom did the audio design and he spent a long time sort of filling the game with little ambient noises because he yeah. quite liked them and he felt they really worked. So yeah, like all the door clicks and the footsteps and the like, whatever. Uh, yeah, all the various splashes as things go overboard. And quite a lot of the screams actually are Tom as well. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're great. Those scenes are great, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Just Our little cut scenes. Lady Armstrong, like, bitch! As she <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I kind of think who that is actually because it's not Amelia did the voice Amelia Tyler did the voices for Veronica but I don't think she did that I think that might be me oh really not, I think so <laughs> or not, what the screaming or, yeah the, the oh. I think that's me <laughs> or it might be Tom I can't remember which tape we use now but but even that just like when we wanted something we just did it we just found a way to do it and did it and that was really liberating and really fun and I think it comes across in the game it's just this, this, this joyful spirit um one thing i really felt about that was the music actually because we have this idea of doing it with public domain recordings yeah which we did a bit on sorcery years ago um where we discovered that u.s army band recordings are public domain they just are so anything recorded by a u.s army band is fair game if you can find it and then i found this jazz album recorded by a u.s army band and i was like okay <laughs> um and after a while that became I had a few places I could go to where I knew the music was usable and then I just listened through it and think oh yeah no that would work really well and that kind of just almost like collaging the music in was again just really fun and like not normally how we would do things at all because it's quite scrappy but uh yeah, it was just a pleasure it was just so much of it was a pleasure and I think that that probably comes across in oh, the game, yeah. I think. I think, yeah, yeah. it's because it, it's great fun. It's great fun to play, uh, for, for sure. I, when I first played, I was like, oh, this is just exciting <laughs> and just so many possibilities. Um, would you would you be interested in, in doing it this way again in that, in that case? Or is this kind of a one-off? You've done this now in terms of the surprise element and doing it in quite such a short um, span. Would, would, would you be interested in giving that a go another time or i, I don't know i'm i'm really yeah i'm really wary of it yeah because, you know like when you go on holiday and you have a really amazing holiday yeah. and like you know just everything's great and there's that fantastic night and you meet some really cool people and just everything works and then you try to go to the same spot again next year and it's just like a bit rainy and it doesn't it's not that great and you're like oh i don't know what the fuss was about um and it, i think there's a lot of practical sensible serious grown-up lessons that we can learn from the production process and the, the you know the, the pipelines that we used blah 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 um but i think actually just doing a mad two-month sprint to try and knock out a game as fast as possible i think if we tried to do it again i don't think we'd have the same kind of energy to it unless no. we had but maybe it's the idea you know maybe if we had another sort of killer short-term idea then then we'd enjoy doing it but I don't know. I think it. I think it was just. I think I feel. I feel at the moment a bit 
about overboard the same way that I remember feeling about 80 days when we were making that, that it was just the right people in the right place at the right time with the right idea. And although it was hard work and overboard was hard work, it always felt like it was good hard work. And like everybody was just running the whole time. And I don't think you can force that to happen. Mm. I think. No, that's fair. Need a, yeah, I think. It, and there were moments on Heaven's Vault that were like that, and there were moments that really weren't. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I like I like generally I like short term projects. I like getting things finished and through, and I like the variety of it. Um, but you always have to surprise people, I think. And I don't know if Overboard 2 or Overboard 3 yeah. or another game with the same engine would have that same element of surprise. <laughs> They'd be like, they're it doing was... it again. <laughs> That's yeah, what they're exactly. doing now. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, and I don't know, a lot, I, mean, I say that, a lot of games do that. A lot of games manage to just come out with, you know, the same thing over and over again. Like, I have nothing but respect for the No Man's Sky team who produce an update every three months and it always goes you always go oh wow this is amazing even though it's kind of the same every time but like it isn't but it is but it, it's sort of it's in this thing that's just this thing and it just gets bigger and bigger and um i say that people get tired of this stuff but maybe they don't i don't i really don't know but maybe i would get tired of it i don't know i think we just have to see what happens next we're back on the highland game now anyway yes um, which i is need definitely to ask a longer yeah that that's definitely going to be a long a longer slower more thoughtful project um for a bunch of reasons but i don't know i maybe i'll take a holiday and do a short thing again in a bit <laughs> drag think, everybody else with me i think that's fair enough i mean it's it's fine to have a break as well that's good um it, in terms of the game design as well it's quite interesting because obviously you characters remember things that you have done oh. from scene to scene and I was just interested in, in the sort of game design aspect of that I mean I'm not a developer so I don't really know how these things work but I, I saw that you were mentioning about play testing and you, you spoke about that a little bit earlier but just in terms of designing a game like that how, how does that work because that must be quite difficult yeah. yeah yeah so I mean this is that's kind of a long-term piece of technology really um it's annoyed me since I was small that games promise you worlds with characters who respond to you, but the reality is they quite often give you worlds in which characters stand in one place, staring straight ahead, repeating the same line of dialogue, like some kind of vending machine. Um, and it's on the player to turn that incredibly static robot, like Disneyland robot, into a real life human being with feelings and personalities. And we can do it because humans are incredibly empathetic and we want to enjoy it and we want to believe in this world. So we make that effort. But I always kind of had this feeling of, well, it's a computer, like it knows what you've done. So why can't we just work with that? And then over the years at Inkle, we've been looking for more and more efficient and expressive ways to track absolutely bloody everything that the player has done, seen, said, and that everybody else has seen and said, and then use that to make sure that the game doesn't miss a beat. Um, we quite often talk about how stories are about change over time and games really hate change over time in their narratives. They like loops. They want to be stuck on a loop the whole time. Um, and we want to do anything to break out of that that we can. So there's a, a system that we built originally for the sorcery games and then we adapted it for Heaven's Vault and it really runs under the entire of Heaven's Vault, uh, which we call a knowledge chain and it's a way of laying out information in a, in a reasonably logical structure so that the game can say, right, you've just learned this thing, which means you must have also learned this, 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 and this, because those are all implied. Um, or you've learned this and this, which means you now definitely learned that, because that's an unescapable conclusion of these two things. And then systems for tracking and testing that quickly. So a line of dialogue can say, look, are you sort of between knowing this and knowing that? In that case, this is an appropriate thing to talk about. And then when you do, you'll have learned this and learned that in a way that doesn't make a writer go mad. And uh, that system is now very, very well developed and very well tested. And it's fairly simple. It's reasonably elegant. It's just exactly the right kind of state tracking to do what we want to do. So something like Overboard, we just pull in that piece of technology and then start filling it in. So there are something like, I actually haven't counted them, I would guess about a thousand facts in the world model of the game, right? 
Um, and in fact, the things like Carstairs thinks the earrings belong to you, or the major has told you that he knows that Carstairs found some earrings. Like it's that level of specific yeah. um, fact. And it's also things like you've thrown a shoe overboard, you know, things that you might have done. And then the game just makes sure that it's ruthless about saying, well, this thing happened, so we need to note that fact down. And well, this action requires us to be in this exact state. If we're not in that exact state, this action is disallowed. And once you get into the habit of writing with that kind of um, methodicalness, it's actually not that bad. You just, every time you write a line of dialogue, you say, well, what are the prerequisites for this? And what mm. are the consequences of this? You just, it's part of your process of thinking it through. And it gets a bit tedious to do sometimes, but it's, it's not hard and it scales really well. So that final, con the final conclusion scene, the kind of the, everybody gathers in the room to discuss the murder scene yes. in Overboard um, is a three and a half thousand line file, which is not a flowchart. I really don't know all of the permutations of that conversation, but it's just everybody tries to throw stuff into the conversation. But yeah. if they're not, they're only allowed to if they know the right things and they're, they're alive and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it kind of ricochets like a pinball table and it just goes bam, 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 bam and eventually comes out at the other end with somebody getting arrested. Um, and that, because we've got the technology and because we've been using it for a while so we know how to use it and we're quite confident with it, that scene, which when I first came to sketch it, I thought, this is impossible. This is never going to work. Actually, it wasn't that bad. And like, we can still tweak it and add bits to it now. Um, so the design process was mostly just following the consequences of the story rather than actually writing anything down. I see. Okay. So, but I'm, I'm amazed that you have uh, that, that, so that whole, that one scene, I'll just say, by the way, thank you. Hello to Escape the North, who's just joined the chat. Thank you very much for coming in. Welcome. Right. Um, just uh, chatting to John Ingold here from Inkle. Um, so yeah, I was just about to say amazed <laughs> that that um, was what, three, three and a half thousand lines, did you say? That final scene? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. About three and a half thousand lines. Um, not all of that is dialogue. Some of that is logic. Um, but it's yeah, it's just dealing with all the alternatives and the different ways it can go, and the permutations of it and things like that. Um, but it's not like you sit down and you write a three and a half thousand line scene. No. You absolutely don't. You write a seventy line scene, and then you go, oh bugger! If I kill the steward, he really shouldn't talk here. So I better fix that. Oh, I better fix that, and I better fix that, and it kind of balloons into this monstrosity because it's always checking that everything that's being said makes sense in the context of the game at the moment hopefully nobody says anything that doesn't make sense yeah no i don't i've, I've not did. yeah i've not come across that yet so no well we did fix the bug just now where um clarissa reappears from the dead to defend her innocence if you go a very particular route uh, but we fixed that now so she's she's back she's back in her grave so that's okay <laughs> <laughs> good good to hear, i guess um we had a question in the chat more about ink rather than overboard um someone yeah. saying uh, over the last year i had the chance to show how ink works to other groups of people programmers and non-programmers at the same time programmers often tend to ask me questions that kind of jump ahead of my intended schedule and while i find that engaging i'm always afraid of making the non-programmers feeling frustrated do you have an ideal schedule for how the different characteristics of ink should be explained? <laughs> um, annoyingly, I do. It's the manual for ink, um, which we wrote with exactly that intention in mind. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the best way of organising the structure of it that I've found. But it's very deliberately written for writers and non-programmers. I suspect non-programmers will find it difficult because programming comes with its whole bunch of ideas um i'm kind of I, i'm generally not very interested in solving the problems of programmers because they're fine they're fine coding tools are fine programming languages are fine computers are fine they know what they're doing um whereas i'm really interested in solving the problem of writers because writers want to write and they want to get involved with this this new technology of interactive fiction and they want to make things interesting and character rich but historically the tools have always got in the way um and that's what i care about so yeah i mean i, I we structured the manual in the way that we thought was the most sensible for writers and not for programmers so it doesn't define any structures it just says here's how you do something simple here's how you make it more complicated um in general i would 
yeah, if I was teaching it, I would just ask the programmers to be quiet. That's what I would do. <laughs> I mean, that's always good advice, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I've got to, I mean, you know, I'm a bit of a programmer myself. I do do programming. Um, but, you know, I just think, I just think the writers, yeah. I just think the writers are more, have more, more, like, ink is for writers. It's their playground. Yeah. Like, you know, and it, that's fine. It's okay. I think, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, we, we have another que- we have a question about Heaven's Vault. Is there any possibility <laughs> to get more of it? Uh, and they say it's one of the best games I've ever played. And I would agree Yay. with that. <laughs> um, I, when we were writing it, we had sort of ideas for sequels and DLC. I suppose you do, um, especially when you have a universe that's that full of stuff. And it really is full of stuff. Um, I don't think we'll ever see any more of it made so uh, That's partly because like yeah i mean adding to the game we i would be so scared of breaking the game if i tried to expand on it because it really is quite a complicated thing that i don't understand <laughs> properly anymore um i don't know i love the universe though i love the universe and the characters so maybe they'll come around again in some way but there's never there's never going to be a sequel and there's never going to be a dlc i don't think I maybe we'll do a remaster in 10 years I mean that would still be good. <laughs> People would like that. Um, that. I think that's fair enough. Again, it's a it's a big game. It's a big world. So I think that's that's fair enough. Um, you, you're mentioning the Highland game. A lot of people want to know a little bit more about it. Um, apart from it being set in the Scottish Highlands, can you tell us anything more about what you're doing with that? So one of the things about the Highland game is it's Joe's game. Um, after Heaven's Vault, we decided we'd kind of split the company so that we each direct our own projects. Um, so I kind of directed Overboard, and he's directing the Highland game. So I kind of don't want to talk about it publicly fair, because it's fair, up to fair, him fair. how that gets said. Um, so we've shown, we but at the same time, we're trying to have a kind of open development on it. So we've got a blog where we post updates about what we're doing, and Joe's been showing some early footage of like the animation system and, and things like that. Um, it's going to be quite interesting. It's quite different for us because it's a much more gamey game than anything we've made before. And that's coming from like what Joe's interested in. Um, and I think on the writing side, which is obviously what I'm doing, I'm still finding my way to what the voice of it is. It's been quite a difficult one to get my head around for some reason or other. Yeah, it's an interesting problem, but it's no, it, it's an interesting problem. It's very different as well. I think that's one of the reasons that I enjoyed Overboard so much is that Overboard is just a whole load of human beings talking to each other, and the Highland Run game, the Highland game, is not not really a whole bunch of people talking to each other. It, it's very not that. Um, but yeah, no, I I I don't think I can spoil anything about it here. Okay. Apart from to say that you should follow follow our update blog and yeah. and you'll know as much as we do. <laughs> <Maybe>. Fair enough. <laughs> um, we had a couple of questions actually in the chat about um, choose your own adventure books and um, what, what do you make of them? Because obviously uh, there's there's a a bit of that a little bit in in overboard because you know you're choosing your different paths and directions. So did you ever read any of those? Were you a fan of those at all? Yeah, definitely. Though I didn't read the Choose Your Own Adventure ones because I think they were bigger in America than they were yeah, in the UK. Um, the things that I grew up on were the fighting fantasy books, which is the Choose Your Own Adventure structure, but with a little bit more game mechanic behind it. And the things that really inspired me in those, and I did read a lot of them, tended to be the ones by Steve Jackson, which is kind of how we ended up doing sorcery. Yeah, actually. well, I can see and, the inspiration for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the reason was that he was always trying to find ways to use the format in clever other ways. So there's a like one of his books called Creature of Havoc has a language that you have to decipher in it, um, you know, which whether that fed Heaven's Vault or not, I'm not sure, but there it is. Um, and there's always secret codes and tricks and things hidden in the illustrations. And he's always pushing the, the boundaries of what that medium can do. And that, I think that I found that really inspiring and exciting as a kid, that idea that you can take something which is a really simple structure, like there's these paragraphs and they go to other paragraphs. And then you can say, how can I how can I manipulate this structure to do something more interesting than it first appears? And I love the inventiveness of that. But I think the other thing that the the fighting fantasy books often did 
and Steve often did, which the Choose Your Own Adventure books didn't, was to consider the granularity of the action within a scene. So in a Choose Your Own Adventure book, they tend to be like two or three pages of story and then some choice. And quite often the choice is actually binary and one of them is a death and the other one continues, which is just sort of rubbish actually. Um, but whatever. But uh, one thing that the, fi the Fight of Fantasy books did was they would say, well, you walk into a bar, who do you talk to? Right, what do you say? Right, what do you say next? And that idea of getting several decisions in before you find out whether what you're doing is a good idea or not. And that builds up tension, especially when you're having to flip the pages and you, you've forgotten where the previous choice was now, so you can't go back. That really struck me and really stuck with me. And then after those, I went on to playing the text adventure games made by Infocom, the kind of typing parser games. And I spent a long time writing those. And they have the same rhythm that you take an action, you get a quick response. You take an action, you get a quick response. But it's it's only several turns in that you'll find out if your chain of actions is doing anything useful or not. And that idea of the player talks, the computer answers, but nobody gets to just monologue. Mm. That, I think that's the thing that really hooked me. And I don't think the Choose Your Own Adventure books had that in them at all, actually. No. I think the fighting, the fighting Fantasy books did a little bit and Infocom did a lot, lot more. And that's really what I think a lot of Inkle stuff is built out of. So when you look at the rhythm of sorcery, it's little choices and little reactions. And we do that in 80 days as well, and they escalate. And actually we do that in Overboard. Like everything is, there should be a choice pretty much every 15, 20 seconds in Overboard. Like there are speeches at the end in that kind of final scene because there have to be but throughout the rest of the game you're constantly should be constantly saying yeah what are you going to do about it what are you going to do you're the player what are you going to do about it and that's like a million miles away from the like the classic visual novel structure which is much more like a choose your own adventure in that you get these long speeches mm. and then maybe a choice and then these long and telltale was a little bit like that as well um for me that pace is is just the whole thing like if people are finding overboard fun, I think that's actually the reason is that it's constantly saying, yeah, what now, what now, what now, yes, what now, what definitely. now? Um, and hopefully you're going, oh, shit. You know that. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and like I quite often have described that previously as being like a game of blackjack of, of 21, of pontoon, right? You get two cards and you look at them and they're 12 and you go, oh, bugger, I'm going to twist. And then you get a five and now you've got 17. You're like, oh no, I'm going to twist. And then you get three and you're like, oh no. And it's just that sense of with every card, it gets a little bit worse. That's that's kind of, in a sense, that's why Carstairs is playing that game because that say. game is a description of actually what Veronica's doing right now in this game. And if that isn't art, I don't know what is. So there we go. <laughs> Very well described. I agree. Um, someone actually mentioned, I don't know, you. I mean, you'll probably have, have known this, but um, it, Overboard apparently isn't your first boat murder because there's one in 80 days as well. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I do like boats and I do like murders. And I've always <laughs> wanted to expand on the murder mystery sequence in 80 days. Like we... When we were writing 80 Days, it took us about nine months. We were knocking it out. We were desperately filling it with content. And the murder mystery was written in the last week before we shipped the game because I was playing it and I thought, oh, we haven't done a murder mystery. We're, we've written this whole game and there isn't a murder mystery. That just feels wrong. We ought to do one. So I stuck one in. I spent a day and wrote this, this relatively short sequence and bunged it on a boat somewhere. Um, and the twist in that one is that the murder weapon is whatever item you most recently picked up that could perceivably be a murder weapon. Okay. So it's definitely something from your luggage that this person gets killed with. And ideally what the player does is it, they start in Japan, they go to the market, they buy the, ka the katana sword, and then this katana sword is used to kill somebody. And they go, oh no, that's my sword. Uh, ideally that's what happens. And I enjoyed writing the, the kind of denouement for that. And I always wanted to go back to that and write something detective -y. And I, I still might, because I still think that's interesting. The problem with it is that if you don't know who done it, it's not that fun. Or sure. if you get it wrong, it's not that fun. And like in, in 80 days, that's fine. Because if you get it wrong, we just say, well, you got it wrong. Anyway, off you go. Yeah. And you go, but no, I just want to go back. And, and But you can't go back ever. That's, that's the whole game with 80 days is that you're constantly being ripped out of whatever you were doing and sent on to something next. You can't really do that in a detective game. It's a detective game, though. You can't just say, well, you got it wrong. Sorry, bye. Oh, well. And, like, I don't know how to solve that problem. I still don't. Like, Overboard just doesn't. 
solve yeah. that problem. Um, like, which I think is interesting because I think Overboard is a detective game because what you're doing as the player is you are finding out things about people yeah. and finding out clues and evidence and putting together theories. It's just you're not doing it in the way that you would expect. So it, I think it becomes more of a detective game the more of it you play. And then you know, there's that twist towards the end, which I suspect you probably know, but I don't want to spoil sure. for people who don't, where it really does become a detective game, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's that's cool. That's a nice way of getting there, but it's still not your Sherlock Holmes. Like I still don't know how you'd make a game where you are Sherlock Holmes and that that's going to work. And I'm not sure I've played a game which really nailed that i liked her story i thought her story was really interesting but that kind of sidesteps it sidesteps it in a different way yeah like you the person behind the keyboard of sherlock holmes and the game doesn't really care whether you know the answer or not and yes mechanically and that's sort of genius but i don't know how often you can do that trick it's interesting anyway no definitely yeah um well we, we've asked you about highlands so um i, I guess the, the the only sort of main thing i wanted to leave it with unless any, unless anyone had any more um questions was is there a game that that's um you know been out recently that you wished you had made oh i hate that kind of question because <laughs> i i've got a really terrible memory um yeah so do i to be fair <laughs> There will be a really good answer, and I won't be able to think of no, it. No, that's fair enough. And I'll, I'll end up insulting a friend of mine who wrote it or, <laughs> like, what or, or about something my like game? that. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I, every time I try to answer that question, I never manage to do it well. So I think I shall respectfully decline that's if fine. that's okay. I mean, I'm happy to, hopefully, I can come back and <laughs> like say on Twitter, oh, yeah, I played this, actually, and that's I really fun. like this. But, um, yeah, off the top of my head. I can't think of anything. But I'm just—I'm also really tired because I just launched a game, so my brain isn't really That's working fine. very well. That's okay. Um, okay, okay. I would like to recommend The Last Express, though. Like whenever anybody asks about games, I always recommend The Last Express, which is very much one of the inspirations behind Overboard, uh, which is a game from 1997, but is extraordinarily well written. It's easily the best written computer game that there's ever been. So I'll just recommend that. If well, there okay. you go. <laughs> um i think finally we'll just take one more someone has said favorite easter egg in the game are there any um little bits in overboard, in overboard? yeah uh, i mean there's plenty of them i so, guess but yeah so what do i like there's there's a lot of snippy responses that various characters can give which i really like there's a running joke about how much veronica likes commander the commander's hat which makes me laugh every time i see it <laughs> um there's the it's the side quest to kill everybody on the boat. Yes. Which is quite hard to pull off. Did you did you do that one? Did you manage I, to do I it? tried it. I didn't manage mm-hmm. it. I think I killed about okay. four people, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um I I've seen from our Discord channel that we set up for the game that, you know, a bunch of people have done it. I like the way that that ends if you pull it off. Okay. I, I think it's quite surprising. <laughs> but like i think it's uh, i'm very pleased with it. i don't think you can really call it an easter egg because it's a straight up part of the game yeah but, sure sure um but it's also it's yeah well it it's also its own thing um but there's that i think the the other one that i liked was uh the thing you find if you break into major sing's cabin Okay, I'm trying to remember that because I have done that. Yes. Yeah, he's got a, like he's got a notebook in his cabin. Yes, yeah. And he had a notebook in his cabin for ages, but I didn't know what was in his notebook. So for the longest time, Veronica was just like, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to look in that. It's his diary. I'm not going to read his diary. And then at some point I was a bit like, would Veronica really not read his diary? <laughs> Is that even slightly plausible? So I was thinking, okay, what can I put in this diary that's going to be really interesting? I could research the life of, you know, 60 year old retired Sikh guy and try and work out what he does every day and write in his diary. I'm going to do that really badly. Is there a more creative idea for what he might put in his diary? And I really liked what I, what, yeah, but that's probably that. If I had to pick something that wasn't like just a random one liner somewhere in the game that I think is funny. Um, or all the conversations that you have in the chapel, all of which I enjoy oh, very much. Yes, that bit is, a, is amazing. That really took me by surprise. I was like, "What? What's going on here?" Hey. But yeah, it was great. Um, it's funny. It's a it's a it's an, a joke nicked from an old series of books. I think written in the twenties called "The Little World of Don Camillo," which were they, they didn't have cartoons in the twenties. 
So when people wanted to make cartoons, and they were basically making cartoons, they would write short novels, short comic novels instead. Um, but the action is very much cartoons. It's cartoon violence and cartoon characters. And it's always the same characters getting into scrapes and sorting them out. It, it reads like a Tom and Jerry cartoon. It just happens to be a book. Um, and there's this one about a Spanish priest and the communist mayor of his town who are constantly fighting and bickering and attacking each other and setting traps for each other. And then the priest will go back to church and God will say, now, Don Camillo, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> like, and Don Camillo's like, well, he was being really annoying. And God says, mm. and there's this lovely dynamic between Don Camillo and God in these books from the 20s. And so I just stole that, to be fair. <laughs> like, it like, works it well. Really funny. Um, but yeah, that was a good, that was fun. Um, we had a question just finish off about um, accessibility in Overboard and would you be yeah. like looking into options about that? And I also have a question about would you ever consider making it integrated with Twitch potentially? I mean, I know that's another, a whole <laughs> extra thing, but I've got to ask because I am on Twitch um, because yeah, a lot of people no, have enjoyed it being in my chat when I'm playing it, choosing options. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um... To tackle the seri the more serious one yeah, first, okay. like accessibility is one of those things that we keep thinking about and not managing to do anything with because we just don't know what we're doing. Um, one of the problems of being a small studio is that you don't have much time to experiment with things. Um, so like I was saying this to someone on Discord earlier, it, maybe it's the same person, I don't know. Um, that you have a problem when you have a feature to implement that you don't know how popular it's going to be and you also don't know how hard it's going to be to do mm. like if it takes one day to do and one person benefits from it then it's fine if it takes a hundred days to do and one person benefits from it then it's not fine um and we just don't know what those numbers are we have no way no way of telling really you know we are we're making games that we love but how much of our market how much of our potential market are you know blind players or 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 whatever accessibility issue is particularly relevant at the time. We just have no idea. So we'd have to get to a position where we're comfortable enough and confident enough that we can develop it and knowledgeable enough that we know what the hell to develop and maybe we can do it. And I would like to do that, but it's, it's difficult to find a day where you say, yep, yeah, this is what we're going to do today. Um, and that's a shame and I wish it wasn't like that but I don't know quite how to solve that problem still there was we were talking about this on discord earlier and somebody said oh you put this plug in and unity just does it and like well that's worth trying <laughs> like you know if something if it is that simple yeah okay that's probably worth trying um and in a way that the the twitch integration is actually really similar like I don't really understand twitch I'm 40 I don't understand twitch why oh, no, do people, neither watch, do I, don't people worry. play computer games <laughs> like like why 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 do you why why would you do that like play the computer game or read a book i mean i don't like, know why? but it seems to work john i don't know it does no i know i get that it's really popular i get that people do it that's fine it's clearly i'm clearly wrong and the rest of the world is right i do understand that i just don't understand it so i feel like if i did a twitch integration i would do a really bad one that was wrong for all weird reasons like it would be really fuddy duddy day it would be like you know it would be like if if some 60s lounge singer decided he was going to sing Taylor Swift songs, you'd just be yeah. like, oh, no, don't, no, don't. <laughs> um, so, you know, someday maybe Inkle will hire someone sort of young and, and hip and with it and all of that who really gets it, who can do that integration. They'll be like, no, no, I've got this. And yeah. then it will be fine. But as it is, I think we would just, we would do it so badly. I just, yeah, because you really... You, you I'm just thinking because I don't know. Doing if to do it, yeah, know. I'm just going to say because, like, with Disco Elysium, they when they they've released their kind of sort of director's cut version, and that has mm. integration, in, so people can see your character build, and they can also, I don't think I don't I think they don't get to interact with it, but they can see the choices as part of like a little plugin, basically. So the streamer mm -hmm. is playing, and people are able. To, so I yeah, I I was only thinking with Overboard if there was a way of getting chat to vote on each yeah, and that kind of thing. But, but then, yeah. like, perversely, I sort of think, well, look, if chat wants to vote on a game of Overboard, they just need to shout, right? That's yes, what yeah. chat's really good do. at doing, is just <laughs> shouting. Yeah. And, like, if that's if it just ends up with loads of people shouting about it, that sounds kind of fun. Yeah, <laughs> true. I mean, maybe yeah. that's okay, and yeah, that's yeah. good enough. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I can't see it being a thing that we do anytime 
soon. You know, we're more likely to port it to the Apple Watch. <laughs> That's not very likely. <laughs> I was going to say, is that going to happen? Is there going to be a surprise no, next um, week? <laughs> if it's a surprise, it'll be a surprise to me. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, unless I don't think there was anything else that people wanted to mention. So, and I've realised that, you know, I've kept you for quite a long time. I really appreciate um, you having a chat oh, cool. with me. It's been really, really fun, actually. I was saying to you before the call, um, because it's a surprise, nobody knew about it. So yeah. we haven't had, been able to talk about it to anyone at any point. So it's just really nice to be able to talk about it, actually, anywhere. I'll talk to anyone about it. Um, so no, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, well, thank you for the game. It's excellent. I'll put all the links if people want to play it because it's brilliant. And um, yeah, but what, what are you doing now then? Are you just um, are you able to have a bit of a break or do you, is it full uh, steam ahead well... onto the next thing? One of the weird things about it is because we had such an excellent production schedule for once ever, we actually finished Overboard about three weeks ago. Um, and like we've been sort of you know, fixing the odd bug here and there that have come in from our kind of early play testers. But actually, we all moved off it. Yeah, we all moved off it in the middle of May and back onto the Highland game. So okay. we've been doing that. And then, then we had to, rem then it kind of came up to launch. We were like, oh, yeah, Overboard. Yeah, no, we should be, we should be thinking <laughs> about this now. So, um, last couple of days i've been pretty much glued to twitter and discord and the steam pages and yeah. fixing the bugs that have come in via the report so thank you to anyone who submitted a bug um and that's been lovely that's been really really lovely actually i've really enjoyed that it's tiring but i yeah lovely that's kind of slowing off a bit now it's not a full-time sure. job anymore i think which is good so that's fine so i guess next week i'll be back on thinking about the highlands think yeah i think so um but I, I, i'm not very good at taking time actual time off like mm -hmm. this week was half term so i took a few days off with the kids uh and that's good in general if i take too much time off i just start writing something in a notebook anyway so i might as well do the thing i'm supposed to be writing as opposed to some other random thing um and that's pretty much true of everyone else on the team as well. I think Annie, the artist, finished her last drawing for Overboard and then was drawing trees for the Highland Games that afternoon. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you just got to put it aside and got on with the next thing. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the things about, about Inkle. Like, everyone who, everyone who works there now and pretty much everyone who ever has worked there because we've had some coming and going, I've just been people who are just really happy to be doing what they're doing, I think. And I think that comes across in what we make. I hope yeah. that's true. And they're not just scared of the bosses. I, hope that, <laughs> <you know. laughs> I think it's true. Um, so, yeah, I'll be back onto that, I think. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, you know, can't wait to see that as well. I mean, fingers crossed, Adventure X, I don't know at the moment. It's looking possibly oh, unlikely. So. It's looking unlikely, oh, but we can, we can yeah. say fingers crossed. Uh, and hope I to see you there if that is the case, but I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I love Adventure X so much. It's yeah, my it's favorite great. games conference of all of them. It's so good. Like I, I, I really missed it last year. Like yeah. actually, genuinely, physically missed it. So I really hope that we do get to it. Um, even if it's just a party for old vaccinated people, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be fine. Yeah, that'd be fine. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, just leave the kids at the door, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I hope so. Oh, I have a request actually from for your uh, your stream people yes. as well, for your viewers as well. Which is, uh, if you do play Overboard and you enjoy Overboard, please leave us a review. Yes. Please, please, please leave I us need a review. To do that as well on um, Steam. Yeah. As niche games, it is almost impossible to get people to leave reviews for you, and the algorithm, which is beginning to think that maybe we're not complete garbage. Because um, we did manage to sell some despite having zero wish list, still thinks we're basically garbage. So if you would leave us a review, it makes an enormous difference to this boring machine that runs all of our sales for the next five, six years. Um, also, they're quite nice for us to see. But, you know, actually, there's just this machine that eats likes. And if we can feed it a like, it's happy. So please do that. And please do that for other indie studios as well, because they really do need them all the time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I will be on it and make sure everyone else is as well. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, thank you 
yours is going to say got the copy of the game for free, so it doesn't count. When it's oh, stitches, so damn. No, it's rubbish, isn't it? So you have to convince your friend to do it. But okay. anyway, yeah. I'm sure yeah. we will. I'm sure we will. They all look very into it, so <laughs> I think we've done our job here. Um, but yeah, th- uh, thank you once again, John. Really, really, really appreciate it. And hopefully, like I said, see you at Adventure X or possibly next year. Who knows? Um, see you at some point anyway. And uh, At some point. You can tell us all yeah. about the Highland game then. <laughs> maybe if we figured it out but <laughs> right brilliant cool. I won't keep thank you any longer thank you very much it's been thank a real you. pleasure cheers